Premji, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, I think uh, uh, a session after Avis's song uh, is a very tough session. It's almost as tough as a session after lunch, uh, <laughs> as such. But uh, um, yeah. So, um, Mr. Premji, I think all of us know um, the very hard-working. Uh, uh, value systems. All of us know the very hard-working uh, Azim Premji, uh, very caring. I, I still remember uh, uh, one incident when the unfortunate uh, air crash took place uh, in Bangalore and um, uh, me and I think four other people were supposed to be on that flight. And I was in Bombay in the Bandra office and I got a call and somebody said, Mr. Premji is uh, looking for you. And then um, I was on the phone and you said, Sudhir, uh, you were supposed to be on the flight. And I um, said, yes, but I changed my program. Okay, you're safe, thank you. And, and I believe many people got that call uh, as such. Um, those days we never used to have phones and my wife got a message at home that Sudhir is safe. Because she didn't know I had not taken the flight. So the caring part uh, was very, very important uh, behind that tough facade I must say you had uh, at that time. Um, I still remember my 6 o'clock appraisal which you took at guest line Atipale when dear Prasanna called up and says, Mr. Premji would like to have an appraisal. I said, okay, that's fine. You know, I was expecting 10 o'clock, but 6 o'clock while a walk. So that's the hard working Azim Premji again. Today, in the next 20 minutes, we will try to find something which people don't know about you uh, as such. Um, since Mrs. Premji is also here, um, how did you two meet? Why don't you, why don't you ask her? Yeah, well, I'm asking her, how did you two meet? And, and, and I'm also curious, who asked who? I don't know how it happened. Nobody asked me and I didn't say yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll leave it there. I'm still waiting for the answer. Well, okay, that's... Uh, that's on the lighter side. And uh, the serious one is not very exciting. I think the families had known each other for a long time. Okay. My father was on the board of uh, Western India for ever since I can remember. So the families knew each other. I hadn't met him. And um, well, I thought he's not too bad. Uh, I could do worse. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how it happened. So, so I, I think all of us are very curious. Did Mr. Premji propose? No, he didn't. He literally didn't. <laughs> I'm trying to think of the words. I remember the occasion he didn't. And somehow. He didn't ask, and I didn't say yes, and then we were at the altar, and then we were married. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> we will leave it at that. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so you must admit she has a sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> the only way to survive. <laughs> <laughs> excellent, excellent. Um, Mr. Bremji, one thing which uh, I think I've been always curious, and I think many of us have been very curious. Um, in the days when the license Raj was at its peak in some sense, um, uh, I believe your father was called the Rice King uh, at one time. And, um, and then many businesses started. Um, uh, I joined pretty late, uh, and I think many people joined much earlier. What sticks in our mind is the beliefs, the value systems. And they, I believe, came in very early. So how did that start? I mean, what made you go into something so tough in some sense during a time when the environment was uh, not even sort of demanding it? You know, we, we started as a very small organization. So uh, we did not need to formally articulate beliefs because they just went through a process of osmosis. I mean, you practiced it, they practiced it, they saw you practice it, they emulated you. But when we started to grow, when we started to diversify, when we started to recruit people from competition because we didn't have internal talent, when we started to recruit people from campus, we said we must have some articulated uh, values which the organization has as its backbone. Which year was this? Sorry? Which year was this? Uh, it was about, uh, let me think about it, around 70, 72. And I came on the scene in 66, so it was pretty quickly after I came after on the scene. Came back, yeah. And we studied a lot of uh, best practices of companies. We studied what we really stood for. And we articulated what we call our beliefs. 
then we we uh, we communicated it uh, very clearly but most important we practiced it you know we practiced it without deviation so it became part of our mental makeup became part of our heart was it tough at that time was it you know the one which was really tough was integrity mm -hmm. because people couldn't believe that a family owned company would not uh, give bribes particularly in government or take shortcuts yeah uh, or in state governments or in the bureaucracy and also in private parties because i don't think private parties are uh, free from uh, accepting and giving bribes that was the toughest part uh, and we used to get a huge amount of flack from our sales folks that they're losing orders losing orders because of this but we stood firm on that we stood uh, 100% firm on that and uh, eventually we realized that Uh, we were winning more orders we were getting better quality orders we were getting better quality employees we were getting better quality suppliers uh because people trusted us and people believed in us so it, a a issue which was initially a liability became an extremely strong asset for the organization put a different kind of a pride different kind of a muscle tone uh different kind of a self respect in in our employees because it was unusual in those days no absolutely and and i think uh, somebody mentioned that uh, uh, the name wipro added so much strength to the individual uh, i still remember uh, there was a there's a shop just next to 88mg road uh, which used to sell khadi uh, and still does i think and i went to buy something there me and my wife shali went to buy something there and uh, and uh, at that point of time credit cards were not in vogue and uh, so we just opened up purse to and said oh oops uh, we don't have enough money so um, so i told him i said look my office is just nearby and uh, it's a very work sir uh, i'll just get the money and uh, just keep it with you uh, so i said i just work at uh, wipro he said oh you work at wipro um, just take the goods and uh, whenever you come this side just give me the payment you know that trust and this is transaction level trading uh, because our i would say um, uh image was determined by the wipro ethics in, in some sense so excellent um your father as i said was known as the rice king and you suddenly had to uh, and he was in the trading business but at certain point point when he passed away you suddenly had to return back to uh, india uh, was that easy was that tough for you at that point of time So he died at a very young age uh, through multiple heart attacks he died at the age of 51 and uh, i was in the last lap of my bachelor's degree in electrical engineering at stanford so i immediately had to come back to take care of family matters i went back for one summer school uh, and then i just had one quart less than one quarter work left which uh, i think 15 years later i convinced my engineering committee to let me do it by correspondence Excellent. and i now finally have a degree Excellent. in electrical <laughs> engineering from stanford university but they warned me please don't come for graduation because we don't want to make it a precedent so i was really the first person who was awarded a engineering degree by correspondence excellent uh, but it was tough in those days yeah. uh, because my father was very involved in uh, social work very involved in national social work and he did not give the right attention to the company so it required a lot of reengineering in the company we had very decent loyal competent people so it required a lot of leadership and coaching to get on the right track so in mrs premji in effect you did marry somebody who had not completed his graduation yeah i know that's was wondering if i done the right yeah, thing yeah that must have been a brave uh, decision <laughs> but you know it's interesting when you say that i think my mother believed very mother in law believed very strongly in education both our families that was the most important thing they could give their children so when she got to know me in a few months she said listen why don't you persuade him to go to stanford for the next 3 months she thought new young wife maybe oh, i'll be able to persuade him <laughs> it never worked so finally i said no she's so keen and i thought how wonderful spending 3 months at stanford i'm going to love it and he said you know i've been working for these years and it's so much more exciting than anything stanford could give me it just makes no sense for me to go back and i understood so the passion was always there yeah mr premji um from trading from trading when you came back 
to hydraulics, to computers, to IT, healthcare, JV with G Medical at that point of time, to lighting, to energy. Um, uh, very diversified businesses to some extent, all seemingly unrelated. And that too, um, you know, it's like a family office or a family diversifying rapidly and professionalizing. Um, what made you go into such diversified business, in some sense unconnected or seemingly unconnected? And you took the risk. You know, in very simple terms, it was very fashionable in those days to diversify. Oh. <laughs> uh, so one was also uh, driven by the fashion in terms of what wanted to do. But you know, our, our movement uh, into toilet soap, uh, which was a real first uh, next step movement, was very much related to our Vanaspati business because we had enormous competencies in uh, processing fats, enormous com competency in managing input-output ratios, in enormous competencies in uh, uh, procurement. And these were all basic materials uh, for making toilet soap. Where we did not have adequate competency was in marketing, but by then we had started marketing consumer packs of Vanaspati, which was quite a marketing challenge because uh, head-on competition was Unilever with 75% market right, share. Right. And we proved that we could be successful against them. So we got confidence in being able to position a marketing brand and being able to distribute it. So we went into toilet soap and uh, we have been very successful in it, uh, extremely successful in it. Uh, and it, it's a real money spinner brand and we have diversified that brand. We went into, uh, into hydraulics just because MS Rao, who's uh, present in this group, came and marketed an idea to us. Yes, I believe so. You were the uh, venture capitalist for him. That's right. Yes. And it was a small business. It was a low-risk business. So we said, well, why not take a bet on it? And we took a bet on it. Uh, we fumbled a great deal in the first few years, but we've got it on an even keel now. We went into information technology primarily because we wanted to go into a high-tech business which had high growth rates which could generate high annuity business, repeat business. IBM had left the country yes. uh, and it had created a vacuum. It had created a vacuum both in terms of sales presence as well as in terms of technology because they were selling junk machines into India, those u u unit record machines, yes. right up to 85, 86. And uh, we, we were able to get a very good act together. We were able to procure technology from Mr. Sentinel there uh, Lee Cole, uh, and uh, we worked on that technology and we came out with an outstanding uh, computer which was an instant success and it was thanks to people like Sridhar who were able to engineer this computer uh, and then there was no turning back. We addressed the domestic market initially but you know we had set up a very large R&D uh, center to be able to engineer the products to be able to build the software because nothing was permitted to be imported in those days. And when imports became freer, we said, why not use these uh, resources to sell a lab on hire? So we set up a lab on hire. Companies like Motorola, companies like Intel were our early customers and uh, there was no turning back. We became a specialist in engineering software. And from that we diversified into enterprise, enterprise software. Yeah. In fact, uh, I believe that, uh, and Dr. Mitha was telling me that, and we have uh, Dr. N.J. Rao also here, I believe, that there was a collaboration set up with IISC in terms of doing some work in term, uh, getting computer systems out. Um, that was a first of its kind at that time because industry collaboration with IISC or any such academic institution was very, very rare. Uh, and you've had a lot of firsts to your credit uh, in many, many years uh, as such. So. Um, my next question is um, on GE, J JV, on the joint venture with JV, uh, with the GE. Um, I believe the decision was communicated to a competitor that the JV would go to them. And then you literally pulled the JV out of, uh, how did you do that? Share that with us. <laughs> you know, the competitor was HCL, so I can, <laughs> I can say that here. I would have and got sued if I said that. So. Yes. Uh, <laughs> and, and we basically 
took a stand that HCL was culturally not the right company for that. Uh, and in a one-to-one -one meeting, we produced evidence to that effect. And that oh, you produced evidence? Yes. Okay. Uh, so, and, and, and the business head who was uh, in charge of this joint venture was superseded by Jack Welch. Okay. Against his recommendation. So, he was our strong supporter also. So, that also helped. It's been a successful joint venture. We do about 650 million now out of which about 250 million are for exports. For exports. Okay. Products engineered, designed and manufactured in India. And it's, 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 a, it's a very computer-like business. It's very heavy on software. Software, yeah. So it is a business which we understood well, and that's the reason we were chosen, and that's the reason that HCL was chosen right. at that point of time. Now, if you look at, uh, again, a common theme across many, many years, uh, your passion for talent acquisition. Uh, somebody mentioned a one point, one and a half hour interview, which you took. I remember you took my interview. It lasted for four hours, including a case study. Uh, as such, the passion for acquiring the right talent, right from the beginning, uh, you had uh, uh, you know, hydraulics, you had the right person came in, you sort of took a bet on him. I think you had Ashok Narsiman, you, uh, you hired uh, and then he started off something. Dr. Mitta, you took the, re the best in that ca class. Um, how did you manage to pull these people when you were such a small organization uh, at that point of time? Um, and I, I believe you didn't pay very well. Maybe I just <laughs> maybe I just <laughs> wore them down with the length of my interview. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's a question you should really ask them. I cannot speak for them. But uh, can I put in a word there? Yes, please. Yes. Same way he managed to get me in as a college dropout. Yeah. <laughs> 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 no, no, uh, I agree, but. Tell me, what's the secret sauce? I mean, that was also very rare. Um, I understand the, the a stream of good people joined. Um, but it was very rare, even when I joined, for the chairman of a company to be sitting with a middle-level guy uh, to interview him. The reality is when you build a company, people are your most fundamental assets. And uh, when the, there are few people who really mold the future of the company, you cannot afford to make a mistake. Uh, maybe it takes me a little longer to be sure that I'm not making a mistake than it takes most other people. So I spend more time with them. But you cannot afford to make a mistake when you appoint key people. Sure. Absolutely critical. I must add one thing here, um, that there are many people in this room, I think uh, somebody said there are 150 CEOs who are ex vaporites today. Um, I'm a venture investor and I did a little bit of study as to how many are entrepreneurs. Uh, there are about 600 entrepreneurs who are ex-Viproid today functioning. 600, uh, about, I think about 450 companies. They have together raised about $1.7 billion in the market space. And their collective market cap today is about $4 billion. Um, that's very interesting. You, you actually, and if I look at the kind of companies we look at as an investor in the last 10 years, in South, a large part of the entrepreneurs which we used to see, not now but at early days, were mostly ex-Wipro people. What made Wiproites potential entrepreneurs? What was the secret sauce? Yeah, we're very, we are very proud of that, that we have been able to create a, a entrepreneurial spirit in people. I think we gave responsibility early, uh, we gave latitude early. Uh, we encourage people to do beyond what they were think they themselves were capable of. Uh, and uh, we, we were able to structure our businesses in uh, a micro manner in which each little business or each little function became like a semi PNL. So they got a lot of self confidence in managing PNLs very early in their careers. No, I think it's, it's, it's really. Uh, we are very proud of it because we funded some of the ex-entrepreneurs, uh, ex-Viproites, and I must tell you the maximum returns have come from there uh, as such. Um, more recently, of course, in the history of your organization, um, you also embarked into philanthropy. Uh, and this is a question to both of you. Uh, I'm sure you discussed a lot. You, how did that happen? 
No, it, it, it happened, I think, too late. It should have happened much earlier. It happened around 211, 212. Basically, you know, I consider my wealth a fiduciary responsibility. Uh, and uh, I consider uh, it as the right thing to do. It's as simple as that. So now 40% of Wipro is owned by uh, the foundation and probably much more of Wipro will be owned by the foundation. But what I've learned, it's uh, more difficult to spend money on philanthropy than it is to make money. Make money. <laughs> it is, particularly when, when you know you are involved in uh, uh, building an institution to be execute that philanthropy to last successfully much after you. It requires a lot of work. Uh, and it requires a lot of evaluation and measurement on an ongoing basis. And the yardsticks are different. The yardsticks are much longer. In some cases, the yardsticks are much shorter. Uh, but it is exciting. It is self-fulfilling. Sure. And I'm very uh, uh, privileged that I have the support of my family on it. And many of these decisions related to diversification, related to philanthropy, um, how much do you discuss at home? I can maybe even ask Rishad and uh, your sons to comment on it. I don't think we discuss very much. But we never discuss very much. I think uh, Azim is somebody who's come with a very clear charted course. And he seemed always very clear, very focused where he was going, even as a young man. And uh, I don't think he needed too much advice or too much this thing. He was very clear. Just like his uh, course on the charity, I would take zero credit. I think it was entirely his decision. He had made the money. He decided this is the way to this thing it. And he certainly, I think the family was all in, in agreement that that's how it should go. Because I think beyond a point, it doesn't help you to have more than you need. And, um, but it was, he was very clear-sighted. And I think, um, like my mother-in-law once told me, it's not important. It's, it's working hard doesn't stress you out. As long as you have a focus in life, if you know where you're going, then you're okay. And I think he's always been like that on his own. If he needed some things, some smaller things, suggesting how we go about it, that was different. But the will, the passion, is the same stream of will and passion that's kept him focused on the Vipro path. Excellent. <laughs> you also went into uh, starting up Prem Gene West. Um, you know, and that's something which is again different first and in each of these you brought scale. Uh, why venture into Prem Gene West? So, you know, uh, we were generating a lot of dividends hmm. and we had a very large endowment with this 40% shares of Wipro which we were uh, in the process of using the dividend for as well as disinvesting some of those shares. So we had to have an investment vehicle and uh, Prem G invests apart from our Endowment investment vehicle is our investment vehicle sure. to get returns then just keeping it in the bank Because the endowment has to grow uh, at least above the rates of inflation. So it doesn't diminish in value year after year What next so many firsts so many successes uh, How do you see Wipro in the next 10 to 15 years? You know we have set ourselves a, a, a vision uh, which we have made public which is 15 uh, billion revenue uh, by the year 2020. Uh, I think we are focused on that at the moment. Uh, we have slipped in terms of performance and we must be modest enough to accept that. And we are in a very major drive now to get back into leading performance. So that is the single-minded focus so far as Wipro is concerned. So far as the foundation is concerned, we intend to grow it very, very aggressively, both in terms of size and in terms of quality. Excellent. And, you know, many of us owe our somewhat today's successes to our days uh, during uh, Wipro. Our learnings, our, our value systems. Um, I remember when I set up IDG Ventures, the first thing I did is talk to Dr. Shed, talk to Dr. Mitha, and, you know, get people around me who knew us. Uh, Obala, uh, for instance, in Bombay and said, can you help us? And uh, that ecosystem was like, yes, of course, the answer is yes. Um, so on behalf of, uh, I think, all of us here, um, thank you very much for joining on the stage today.
sharing your experiences. We've known a little bit more about you uh, and your family, which we didn't know about earlier. Uh, and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.